everybody, hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled The Skeptical Structures of Max, uh, edited by James Beckett and published by Roma Publications. Artist James Beckett shines light on inventor and entrepreneur Max Himmelheber, who played an important role in the modernization and then proliferation of particle board. As an act of frugality, Himmelheber bound the waste materials of sawmills with fennel resin, resulting in a highly versatile, stable product. Particle board, also known as chipboard, now accounts for 80% of the material in furniture produced globally and has spawned a love-hate relationship due to its disposability and more recently discovered environmental impact. Almost preempting the material pitfalls, Himmelheber turned his attention to a set of philosophical reflections on humanity's role in an industrialized world. In his quarterly journal, Scheide de Wege, Crossroads, he published his own writing displaying a culturally conservative distrust of unchecked technical progress, a selection of which is to be read in this book. His journal was thus subtitled For Skeptical Thinking. His character permeates these pages as we learn of his multiple intersections of boy scouting, Shintoism and environmentalism, traits usually foreign to an industry magnate. Through a historical account of his little-known figure, the skeptical structures of Max is as much a lucid memento mori as a call to reimagine our relation to the environment. Lessons from Japan by Max Himmelheber, 1980 I was on a tour of a construction site in Japan in the spring of 1953. The first thing I noticed was something I would probably have passed by had I not been interested in craftsmanship since I was a child. I was astonished to see that the teeth of their saws were pointed backwards and not forwards as they do in Germany. Here, the saw cuts when you push it away from yourself, whereas in Japan it cuts when you pull it towards yourself. Shortly after having seen these saws, I observed the same thing when planning. We push the plane away from us. The carpenter speaks of pushing an edge when he works the narrow side of a board with the long plane. The Japanese carpenter pulls the plane together with the pleated chips towards themselves, as if in embrace of the workpiece. These are not trivial details. Rather, they tell us something about a profound difference between the Japanese and Westerners, and perhaps all other cultures on Earth. This became clear to me in the course of numerous longer stays in Japan. Many of our tools are weapons in nature. Their use is often perceived or described as wrestling with the material. From the earliest times, monumental works were created that were intended to have eternal value. The pyramids, the megalithic buildings in Europe and South America, the temples of antiquity, the cathedrals of the Middle Ages, the figures of Easter Island, bronze and marble sculptures. This is of such importance to us that in general we judge cultures by the enduring works they have left behind and that we equate a slackening or extinction of form creation with an extinction of culture. Japanese culture, however, is not a work of culture, but one of feeling and inwardness. Its essence does not consist in the fact that people yield creative works from themselves, but in the fact that they take the world into themselves. There is nothing monumental about original Japanese art. It was not until Buddhism, initially alien to Japanese nature and imported relatively late, that a few colossal statues and oversized temples emerged. 
but they were unable to break the predominance of emotional culture, indeed the scorn of the monumental. In the Zen schools, Buddhism was made Japanese. Zen did not seek the sublime outside or above the world, but in a world reduced to its innermost essence. All expressions of Zen Buddhism, its buildings, pictures, poetry, are of an abstract barrenness, and at first almost bitter astringency, like the unsweetened green foam tea of the tea ceremony. But on the basis of this astringency rises a cheerful, dissolved wisdom that reflects and repeats the universe and the whole of creation in even the smallest things, and through this knowledge gives humanity a serenity that can no longer be shaken by anything external. During my work in Japan, I had the good fortune to live often and for a long time in Japanese houses, sharing the day's work with the master of the house and the sons, and the evening and holidays with the families. It very quickly became clear to me that the Japanese have developed the ability to live in two completely different spaces of thought and feeling strictly separated from each other in the course of the day. When they slip on their shoes, when they leave the house in the morning and go to work, they step out of the Japanese world of feeling and thinking into another space with contrasting laws. They are able to completely surrender to this western space and its logics for the duration of their daily work. I have seldom had such hard-working and intelligent co-workers in the laboratory, factory or lecture hall as my young Japanese engineer colleagues who also displayed an almost insatiable thirst for knowledge. I could not spend an hour alone on a piece of work without someone coming up to me with the stereotypical and touching, please teach me. The half-hour lunch break brings about a total disconnection from work. We blow the dust out of each other's overalls with compressed air and go to the factory canteen, which is no different from a large Japanese living room. The old cook greets us with a deep bow while we take off our shoes in the covered anteroom that still forms part of the courtyard. A low table stands on mats, the chopsticks are ready. Pink cubes of raw fish meat with grated radish lie in small light green porcelain bowls. The snow white rice steams away in the large copper covered cedar bowl and the iron kettle hums on the bronze charcoal basin. We settle down on the cushions, nod to each other and reach for the chopsticks in silence. As much as some may have the urge, they do not talk shop, but instead enjoy the food, the fellowship, the flowers in the tokonoma, existence in general. But when the shoes are put back on, the work continues with full intensity where it left off half an hour ago. This continues until everyone returns home for an evening bath. After work, Japan bathes. Literally, all of Japan. Almost every house has its own bath, but there are also numerous public bathhouses. This bath is much more than a hygienic activity. It is a daily immersion of an entire people in a natural element that unites them all. More than 10,000 hot springs provide countless towns and villages with their natural bathing water. People bathe together in these hot rock pools, men and women, girls and boys, all without bathing costumes, even in closed indoor pools. When the Americans came to the country after the war, they took offense at this and demanded strict separation of the sexes. Yes, yes, certainly, said the Japanese, bowed, stretched a rope across the pool and continued unabated. 
In Nobori Betsu on Hokkaido, I met whole school classes with male and female teachers frolicking together in the hot volcanic water. With their evening bath, the Japanese strip away the entire Western thinking space and dive into their original world. Afterwards, one wears the comfortable loose kimono and, depending on the season and occasion, only light linen or a heavy dark silk version, which in revered families is decorated between the shoulder blades with the coat of arms of the house. This clothing is synonymous with evening household socializing or the disposition of a Japanese-style hotel. When staying in a given house, a guest is also expected to participate in this transformation, which is a particularly rare treat for a European. A host is indeed pleased and endeavors to facilitate this experience of detachment from everyday life as a special gift to the guest. It is not customary to talk about work or the politics of the day at an evening get-together. Rather, art, literature, theatre, education and history can form the topics. Every educated Japanese person has heard of Homer, Shakespeare, Goethe, just as we have heard of the great Japanese woodcut and haiku masters. The fact that I knew the most popular Japanese fairy tales from an old Japanese fairy tale collection that our father had once brought back from a trip aroused enthusiasm and provided material for conversation about fairy tales, legends and myths. Incidentally, it is not expected that there will be constant conversation, as is the case here. There can be a pause in the conversation in which no one says anything for a good quarter of an hour without the nervous tension that arises in our culture in such cases. Perhaps my neighbor will say casually, you know, it's the time of the silk rain and we listen to the rain dripping from the roof into the garden. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.